Good morning, everybody, and uh, let's get started. Thanks for coming by, by the way. Uh, my name is Ganesh. I work for Airbnb, and this is just, let's start off with introductions on the speakers. Um, this is Liang, Ben, and Nadia. Okay, Nadia, she'll be here. Um, we've worked as colleagues at Airbnb, and we've worked uh, in our career, LinkedIn, sorry. <laughs> I just moved my jobs to my um, new job. And uh, we've, all five of us have worked extensively on search and recommendation systems. Um, so hopefully you'll find this tutorial very useful. But just to start off with a show of hands, how many of you are from academia or a research lab? Just so we understand the audience. So, and how many are you from industry? OK, so we have a more dominant set on the industry. And how many of you have done any form of deep learning in production in industry? OK, you're all the people we need to watch out for. Right? Um, so f thanks a lot. And how many of you from, are from the West Coast, California, or Oregon, Seattle? You're all really motivated because it's 4 o'clock in the morning. So thanks for coming by. Um, and hopefully, we should make this uh, useful for you. So this is how we structured our tutorial. Essentially, you can consider this to be two parts. We've broken down into four parts, but two major parts. The first part would cover the foundations and how do we do deep learning at scale. And the second, second half of the presentation will cover a case study on both the jobs recommendations and job search at LinkedIn. So the idea here is to give a mix of both um, foundational theory and what are some best practices as well as uh, some specific case studies that happen at LinkedIn at scale. So what has been shown in the second part is actually implemented. First part is uh, more of a foundation and architecture review. We will stop for a coffee break and we will also stop for Q&A at each part. However, um, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So if there's something that uh, bothers you um, or something that is not clear, please feel free to uh, ask us. Yes? Oh, this light. Uh, is, that, is that better? Yeah, thank, thanks for pointing it out. Um, so if you, if you feel stuck by anything, please feel free to interrupt us. And if there's something too, too much details into one particular topic, we are happy to take it offline. Yes? Yes. Yes, thanks for asking that. I, uh, we will put the slides up on SlideShare. Right. Yeah, we will put the slides up on SlideShare, and uh, and so it should be available. You should be able to search for it on Slide. Um, ben, uh, just SlideShare.net, and we we'll search for it, or do we? Oh, we have a we have a web page, and we'll put that link on the web web page. I don't know how often that web page would be updated. What if we? Um, I'll tweet it out if we search for hash KDD to 2017. Um, I'll put the link on Twitter. Okay, so so you can, so it's available. Then we'll coordinate that. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Um, so let's get going. Any other questions before we start? So what's the motivation? First, let's start with why recommendation systems and then go on from there. I think it's almost a given right now that in, when you open a web page or open an app and it knows who you are, it behaves specifically tailor-made for you. 20 years back, that was not the case, that you could Amazon or Netflix, when they brought it up, the recommend, recommendation systems, it was a new concept. But right now, it's not, no longer something that is new in the sense uh, on the user-facing side. It's almost a given that a particular personalized system behaves like it is a personalized system. But in any case, I would like, I wanted to point out a few instances of uh, impact of recommendation systems. I was actually on the uh, Rexis when Netflix made the claim that recommender system is a half a billion dollar industry. I went to one of the people who worked in recommendation systems and asked him, I hope you get a slice of it. Um, so, so it is a. Um, it has had tremendous impact on different areas. The point of 
make putting these three examples is that there are three different, very different domains. And in all these three domains, there's been tremendous impact. And this is not a scientific top three list, it's just a random sample. But you could populate this with uh, many, many other things. How about search? So there's always this, uh, this thing between search and recommendation systems. I've been with to Sigar a few times with Access, and they, they seem like different communities, but what we've realized is that they're actually the same community. Um, the, let's say you're searching for things to do in Halifax. A search person would consider this to be a classic IR information retrieval problem. If you ask a recommendation person, they might answer that these are the suggested set of links given your query and your context and user. Um, so, the, so, however, I, we believe that the marriage has happened with personalized search. So when you talk about search that is highly personalized, typically in social networks, but it's happening in various other domains as well, it is a mixture of uh, search and recommendation systems. You could consider ranking to be a function of query, comma, user, comma, context. In case of classic search, you don't have the query. Um, and also, to look at the other side of it, a lot of recommendation systems, which, which we'll cover in detail, the architecture is, an underlying architecture is actually a search engine, a search inverted index. So these are, we consider them to be equivalent problems. So throughout the talk, if you use the recommendation, if you use the term recommender system, or if you use the recommender system search, think about them as uh, the same, essentially. Thank you. So why deep learning and why now, right? The many of the foundational issues that uh, were covered in deep learning have existed in the 80s or even before that. But why is it that we are doing deep learning right now? Is deep learning actually requires two things. One is we need very high computation power. And the second thing is we need lots and lots of data. Why not in the 80s? This is actually an advertisement from the 80s. You can see that a 10 megabyte computer costs $6,000. So, and the, on the right side is a terabyte drive right now, which is $54. So essentially, the memory and the CPU have crashed over time, making it more and more democratic for computation. The second thing is the amount of data that is created. I can't even comprehend this number right now, but that's the amount of estimated data that we create every single day through our activity. So every time you log into a website or an app, there's an event fired. Every time you click, there's an event fired. Any action is an event. And these are all actionable items. These are all events that can be later used to personalize the experience for you, as well as other purposes. So um, I don't, there are some large number of numbers of iPhones worth of data, large number of zeros of iPhone worth of data created every day. So there is the, because of these two factors, we are kind of in the middle of a perfect storm where deep learning can actually make an impact, huge amount of data and computation power. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that the computation power is also somewhat democratized. With AWS, Azure, and other cloud services, we do have the ability to not necessarily invest in a huge amount of hardware, but to rent them out and test your algorithms. So it's not just the big companies that can do that, but it's a whole bunch of companies who can do it. So why deep learning, right? So I pointed out to two examples here. One is a self-driving car, and the other is actually a machine translation happening in real time on Skype. So someone's talking and in real time. In a lot of these contexts, deep learning has made a tremendous dent already. And uh, just to sample a few other applications are image classification. Uh, of course, Im image was one of the first huge applications with uh, ImageNet. But it's also created a dent in a lot of other areas. So essentially, deep learning is eating the world at this point. And we do believe that it is also has a huge impact on recommendation systems and such. One of the things we looked up for when we were doing is to see if there is a single point where you could have all the information. And hopefully, this tutorial will be the startoff point where you have the information on recommendation systems and such. So why now, why deep learning and recommender system specifically? Um, in general, you can talk about, uh, this is not a very scientific classification of just the top two items, but in general, when you talk about deep learning, you have impact in terms of features, and you have impact in terms of a more complicated model. 
In terms of features, we have better semantic understanding of words. We'll talk about some of them later. And um, better classification of images. So when you have a recommendation system based on images, we also, we don't need the images to be explicitly tagged. Uh, these images can be classified automatically. And we also have a more complicated modeling. So you can think about deep learning as automatically learning a set of functions and these things can have a huge amount of impact as well. So both in terms of features as well as in terms of model, um, this is uh, deep learning can have a tremendous impact on recommender systems. So let's move on to part one of representation learning and uh, some key concepts. So what is, this is just a general diagram from Ian Goodfellow's very popular book. Um, we, machine learning in general falls under the category of uh, AI and within that has representational learning and within that comes in deep learning. Right, so these are just to categorize um, how we look. Deep learning is not different from machine learning. Deep learning is not different from AI. These are all parts of AI. So this is brief outline of part one. We'll talk about, uh, we'll start off with word to vec which is really shallow learning, but it gives the foundation for embeddings and other things that we'll talk about later in the, in the lecture. And we'll cover some architectures with uh, feed forward CNN and RNNs. And we'll also talk about how to train uh, deep neural networks. So let's talk about embeddings, which is really the first core foundational Lego piece on top of which a lot of things are stacked up. So embeddings have had a good impact on uh, natural language processing. And we also, um, they also have, one of the main things, eerie things about embeddings is that they carry semantic meaning into words, and we'll talk about some of them later. Usually words where you have one meaning, but they also find similar meanings, synonyms, antonyms, etc. One of the key points about understanding text is, is actually understanding the context and understanding the meaning. The way humans understand meaning, text, natural language is inherently ambiguous, and the way humans understand meaning have been traditionally different from how computers understand. But with em embeddings, this can uh, change quite a bit. A simple example is the two things that I talked about here where the word Lincoln can mean very, very different things depending upon context. In the first case, Lincoln points out to the president, whereas in the second case, it well, unless you are the cousin or Lincoln was not driving at that time. So it's basically just a, um, you're talking about the car, most likely talking about the car, Lincoln. But these kind of issues keeps happening over and over again. Another example, why why is this important? Is because you may have heard about this case where uh, Berkshire Hathaway stocks went up because Anne Hathaway won the Oscars or Emmy. And then the systems, there was a lot of positive sentiment around the web on Hathaway. And because the context was lost, some of the automatic trade, trading systems went uh, buying Berkshire Hathaway. So context is extremely important in, in understanding the meaning of words and deep learning can help in understanding the context. So how do you represent a word? So let's start with the most simplistic representation, right? Which is uh, you have a big vector that, that, is, that has the dimension equal to the vocabulary size. And one, it has only zeros and ones and one represents uh, that that particular word and everything else is zero, right? It actually represents no meaning. For example, run and jog, the distance between them in the space is the same as jog and mathematics, whereas run and jog could, needs to be closer together. There's also the word document representation. Again, we're not going to the details because these are traditional techniques. Um, and in general, the philosophy we are trying to follow in this whole thing is to give you the intuition first and there are a bunch of references behind which you can refer to for more details. Um, there's also a co-occurrence matrix which you can put in for word to document. These are uh, techniques that are, have been traditionally used. The trouble with the co-occurrence co matrix, matrix is actually pretty effective um, and has been effective for some time. The trouble is that the dimension is very, very large because you're talking about word into document. Um, that problem in general can be handled by um, SVD techniques which aim at reducing the dimensionality by, by looking at the top eigenvalues and eigenvectors. 
but it does come at a very high computational cost. And if you have to add even one row in that matrix, you typically have to redo uh, the whole thing. So that's that's the um, trouble with uh, representing in terms of Word document matrix. That's where word embeddings come into picture. The key conjecture here is that uh, context matters. You are taking a word, and we are talking. We are going to talk about the surrounding words which form a context. Um, the definition of context is uh, intentionally fuzzy, but typically you def you define the context. And in context of sentences, you can define context to be uh, the surrounding words. So what you a, a typical biogram model in this sentence would try to predict what would what is the probability of typing in Lincoln if your previous word is Abraham. But a skipgram model tries to predict the context given the word. If you look at word to vector paper, there are two types, skipgram and continuous bag of words. You can refer to both of them. But essentially one of they are inverses, you can think about them as inverses of each other. One is predicting context given word, and the next one is predicting word given context. So when you, we'll talk about the last function later, but just pictorially, um, what happens is that Vertivec has shown some eerie things in terms of uh, similarities. And one of the intuitions why it happens is that it clusters, not only clusters the, on the left side you have countries, it not only clusters the countries together, it also tends to uh, match the distances between corresponding entities. So for example, the distance between uh, China and Beijing Russia and Moscow are somewhat similar. And that actually plays an important role in context as well. Um, it's also fun to look at these similarities. Um, this is, a, of course, a very high simplification because I personally find, I mean, the word to vec is typically high dimensional and I personally find three dimension hard to visualize and fourth dimension is impossible. Some basic notations, again, we're trying to avoid as many as much as possible the equations, but we just want to give you a general flavor. Um, what we are trying to predict is probability of context given word parameterized by theta, where these are the learning parameters that you typically want to learn. And if you assume uh, a in certain independent set and uh, you're trying to, the last equation represents the loss function. And we'll talk a little bit about the loss function and some of the tricks that Vertivec does. Again, we encourage you to look at the original paper. So typically, because it is a, typically the, the loss function is, is put in as a softmax regression. And in the softmax regression, you are explicitly trying to find the distance between uh, two vectors represented by theta. And uh, you're trying to optimize the product of all these representations. So one, sorry, one common issue that we encounter is that uh, the denominator is very, very um, expensive to compute because denominator is compute, computed over all the context. And so instead of computing everything, uh, one trick that is being played, normally played is we assume that we are sampling from a uniform distribution, we do negative sampling. So we just sample instead of finding the entire thing. It's a standard, standard statistical trick where if you can't find a representation of the entire population because it's too large or too hard to compute, you take a sample of it. Uh, word to vec itself is not a deep learning model, though it's, it's, a very, it's, it's, it's very interesting that a lot of times word to vec is referred as deep learning. It's actually not, strictly speaking, a deep learning model. But what it does is that it forms as an initialization. Some of these things, when you go into a deep learning model, first of all, Vertvec by itself is very effective, even though it's not a deep learning model. The second is that it forms a good initialization for some of the deep learning models that we'll do later. So we're going to move to deep architectures, but I think this is a point where we pause, and do you have any questions? Oh, sorry, please go ahead. Let me try to restate the question so everybody heard it. Is it that, how is, how difficult is it to 
train in a specific domain, Vertivec. Is that correct? How much data? So the, so the question is how much data we need to train for a specific domain because training on Wikipedia and getting generic vectors may not be effective for a particular. That's a very good question, actually. And one of the key conjectures of Vertivec is that context matters. So if your context is different from Wikipedia's context, then you do need to train in your domain. We typically do need lots of data to, to get the right, um, right vectors. Um, that is unfortunately the case. And it, how much is hard to guess. It depends upon uh, your specific problem. But we do need, need uh, traditionally, we do need lots of data. Um, and I, I do agree with your point that you have to train specific domains. In LinkedIn as well, we trained um, our data set on, on our own specific data set. Because for us, uh, things can be different from, uh, from, the, from the web domain. Uh, for example, uh, Java and Python may mean very different things in outside world. So Java is coffee, Python is a snake. But if you come within the professional context, they may actually be similar. So uh, that's an example that I can give where a specific domain may matter more than, uh, I don't know what, I, I pulled up that example, so I don't know what it means in the Wikipedia domain, but that's, a, that's an example where domain specificity can matter. So the question is, if we don't have enough data, can we can we initialize it with uh, pre-trained data and then apply your data? Absolutely, yes. Yes, you should be able to do it. Is that correct? Yeah. You should be able to use the, because it gives some, some meanings in some context for the language. The general language context may remain the same. So you could initialize them with uh, Wikipedia data, GloVe, or any of the other uh, vectors the data that is available publicly, and then train on top of that. Yes, absolutely. Any other questions? Yeah. So good question. I think the question, if I may restate for the audience, is that uh, what what dimension should we take for word to vec Because that seems to have an impact on performance. Is that correct? Um, that's dimension is typically a hyperparameter. We are going to cover some of the hyperparameters issues later. Ben, in your slides, right? Are you going to cover some of these aspects as well? Yeah. So we will cover some of that, but um, I think it's 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 unfortunately there's no black and white answer for that on, on how much it really depends upon the context, and that's where you may have to try a few different things. Um, that's unfortunately the case with few deep learning hyperparameters that you have to try a few and see what works for your domain. There's no magic number for one but for any particular domain. I mean we've seen some things work for us, but that's not a not by any way generalizable. Any other questions? Thank you, Nadia. All yours. So we're moving to the next part. This part is meant uh, as a primer of, to describe a few key concepts in deep learning. Given the limited amount of time, I cannot uh, go into a lot of details for every one of these concepts. So I recommend the book by a good fellow at Al for uh, more details. I'll uh, briefly over do an overview of some very common deep architectures, such as feedforward networks, convolutional neural nets, and recurrent neural nets. And then I'll talk about how we train uh, those networks. So let's start with uh, the basic building block of those networks, which is a neuron. And a neuron is simply a computational unit. Do we have a point? 
that is going to take some inputs here, drawn as x1 to x4, apply some affine transform to them. So we'll take every one of these input, multiply it by some weight to produce that linear combination there, add a bias, so that's the affine transform. And then on top of that, we apply a function f here, which is called the activation function. And so the neuron produces uh, this output a, a for activation, and that's uh, all that it does. So ne then the next, oh uh, yeah, so let me talk a little bit about some activation functions. So some common ones are plotted here. You have the sigmoid function, which uh, maps a real number into the zero one interval. And it's often used, for example, at the final layer for uh, to map a real number into a probability. For example, if you have a binary uh, classification and you're trying to do logistic regression at the end of your network. Um, another one that's related to the sigmoid function is the hyperbolic tangent here, which uh, leaves in the minus one, uh, plus one interval here. So this one, if you look around zero, it's within that area, it resembles a little bit identity. So it's easy to train if you manage to keep the activation functions close to uh, zero. Uh, the final one that I want to mention is the rectified linear unit that's being uh, more and more used uh, today. And this one is piecewise linear. It's also, called as, it's also known as the positive part. So on the positive quadrant, it's just like identity. And on the negative part, it saturates at zero. All right. So these are very common activation functions. So what do you do next once you have one neuron? Well, you add a few more of them here, and you build what we call a layer. And so in a each uh, neuron in the layer uh, interacts with the um, units from the previous layer. Each neuron is parameterized by its weight uh, vector, here W1 for the first um, neuron, a bias, and it has its activation function. And you can, um, so what you can do is take all of these weight vectors from the different neurons in a, in a layer and collect them all in one matrix. And that gives you the matrix notation for the activation, the output of this given layer. And so the good thing with this uh, matrix notation is that one, first it gives you a more compact notation, which is nicer to write uh, mathematical derivations, and the other thing is that it allows you to use fast linear uh, algebra routines to perform your computer, computations quickly uh, in the network. So here I have condensed in this W matrix all the weight vectors from every one of those neurons. I have a bias vector here, and the output is a vector here now. Actually, there's a typo that should be an X here. All right, so from a layer, we get to a feed-forward network by adding more layers. So I showed four of them here. And the number of layers in your network defines the depth of the network. And this dimension here, which uh, is related to the dimension in each layer, is called the width of the network. So the first layer is called the input layer. Then you have a series of hidden layers. Here are two of them. Each one has its weight matrix, its bias vector. And the final layer is the output layer. And this, um, this layer is uh, actually why we use this feed-forward network. It uh, will give you the result for the task you're trying to accomplish based on your input. So for example, if you're trying to do some prediction in supervised learning, um, you can think of this feed-forward network as a way of approximating the function that gives you the label as a function of the inputs. Uh, but using some non-linearities that come from the network and the activation functions that you use at every layer. Uh, in the output layer, uh, depending on what you're trying to do, you can use different uh, activations. If you're simply trying to do a linear regression, well, you would use a linear unit that just does the affine transform and doesn't add any uh, activation, uh, non-linear activation on top of it. If you're do, trying to do a logistic regression, well, you can use the sigmoid activation function here to do a binary classification. And if you're trying to do a multi-class um, classification, you can use the softmax that you can think of as a generalization of the sigmoid. All right, so um, that's for feed-forward networks. I'm going to move now to the next uh, very common type of neural nets, which is the CNN, the convolutional neural networks. And this is a 
type of network that's specialized to dealing with um, large size, very structured data, structured like a grid, for instance, uh, in two-dimensional, you can think of images that are um, a matrix of pixels. Or on a one dimension, you can think of a time series. And so um, what is convolution? Well, convolutional filters are used in signal processing to be able to extract some features from a signal. And for example, from images, they can extract some edges or texture. And they have some nice properties that I will describe in more details in the next few slides. But what I want to show you is an example of what convolution can do to an image. So here you have the original image, and you apply a convolution that uses, uh, in this case, this kernel, and I'll show you later how we apply the kernel to the image. And this kernel, for example, is called an edge detect kernel. You can see it's extracting edges from the image. So what it does is then, when you take this matrix and you slap it on, um, on the original image and you center it on some pixel here, it will take the value of the pixel in the middle, multiply it by minus four, take some neighboring pixels, and then add those up, and this is what gives you the edge detection. This one is a different kernel, which is the sharpened kernel, and you can see that it makes um, the image sharper. So it will, on the pixel it's centered on, it multiplies its value by five, and then it subtracts minus one from some neighboring pixels. So in an animation, this is what, how the convolutional filter or the kernel is applied to the matrix. It, this kernel here, drawn in orange, is um, centered on some pixel, and then it will take every value from the image here, multiplying by some weight, and aggregate them. And as you move it through your image, you get what we call the convolved features. So, Convolution has uh, a few nice properties. Um, so try to uh, think of this image application and imagine you have a very, very large image of size n by n pixels. So that would give you n squared input units. And if you were trying to pass it in one of the feed forward networks that I showed you earlier that were fully connected in my slides, uh, meaning that every hidden unit here at the top is connected to every input unit. And if your hidden unit had was trying to produce k features, then you would end up with having order k times n square parameters. And so it, this can be very computationally expensive. So one idea of convolutional neural nets is to actually, instead of doing fully connected layers, to leverage local uh, connectivity by making the hidden units here con connected with only some contiguous input units. So for here you see I have all those lines. Here, I'm making this first unit just uh, use the first two input units here in the combination. So we will go from the weight matrix here that had uh, one, every row is a, is a weight vector for one of these hidden units. And I zeroed some of them by removing some edges here. So the first hidden unit just takes the first two input units, etc. So this is the idea of a hidden, uh, uh, of a local connectivity and it allows first to start reducing your number of parameters. If you want to further reduce the number of parameters, what you can do is start sharing those parameters. So we move here to the convolutional operation, and what happens is that you start the first two parameters that you're using here in the first weight vector, you repeat them in the next vector. So those units are sharing the first um, the two parameters. And this is the kernel. Here I show it in one dimension, Earlier I had an image uh, example where it was a 2D. So your kernel vector, when you put it in the weight match matrix in a, in a 1D input, you get a tuplets matrix, as you can see. And so local connectivity and parameter sharing allows convolution to scale to large input and images. And it has one more property that I want to mention, which is that it's equivalent to translation, meaning that you do, if you do a little shift in the input, you translate a little bit your pixels, say, your output will not change uh, too much. All right, so before I get to a CNN using convolutional uh, filtering, there is one more uh, operation that I want to describe, is it's that of pooling. So in the previous uh, slide, I showed you how from the image we get the convolve feature. 
And then what we do is pool some of those features by aggregating them over a region. So that allows to further reduce um, the size and it allows also to curb overfitting. And there are different ways where you can pool uh, those features. You can use a max that will extract the max uh, out of all of uh, the features in this region, or you can take their mean, for instance. So now we have the building blocks of a CNN. And so a convolutional neural network is simply a combination of convolutional layers. So here in this image, I'm showing at the bottom the input. This in green is a convolutional layer. You can see that it's taking some pixels and, are, and uh, applying convolution and outputting uh, some convolved features. Then pooling layers, here we're showing max pool, again, that will aggregate some of the convolved features. And at the end, some fully connected layers. So CNN have been widely used uh, in image applications, and I'm showing one example here, which is ImageNet. Uh, for image uh, recognition. So the network looks like this. It has five uh, convolutional CNN layers followed by three fully connected layers. Uh, it was used, it was trained by using two GPUs and you can see on the image that um, they split the training at the top on one GPU and this is the second GPU. They use rectified linear units um, and they used a very large data set with around 1,000 um, categories of images to classify. And here I show uh, some of uh, the filters that are learned by the first uh, convolutional neural net layer. This is what the first GPU did, and this is what the second GPU did. You can see that the first one specialized in detecting edges, and this one more on color contrast and textures. Here you can see some results. So at the top you have the, the image. There are uh, true labels and the top five uh, labels predicted by the network. Uh, those ones were correctly classified. This one, the first uh, predicted category was not the right one, but the next ones, one was, and these were misclassified. Uh, but with this network, it was a very successful network. They got 63% accuracy, and uh, in 85% of the cases, the correct answer was within the five top uh, predicted ones out of 1,000 um, possibilities. All right. So that's for convolutional neural nets. I'm now going to uh, move on to the last uh, very common architecture in um, deep networks, which is recurrent neural networks. So these networks are specialized in dealing with uh, sequential data. So an example could be a next word prediction. Imagine that I had a sentence that said, I was born in France, and so I can speak, and we try to predict the next word. It would be French. So recurrent neural networks uh, allow to do this task because they have a feedback loop drawn here that passes information from one step to the next one. So the output of the um, hidden, the, the, the output at time t minus one is fed back into the network here, a uh, uh, box that, I'll leave it as a black box, but you can put uh, any particular um, architecture in there, and used as an input to produce the next output. So neural networks do parameter sharing, but in a little bit different way from convolutional networks. So the parameter sharing here happens over time because the output, the update of the output unit will depend on the previous output unit through um, that repeating module that's here. So this leads to very deep computational graphs because we are uh, repeating that module over and over again um, across time. So e one thing that we can do is uh, to show that is unfold that uh, compact representation here, where you have here the sequence, so the time indexes, and you see that an N, uh, RNN is simply a chain uh, structure that repeats that module over and over again across time, and each layer passes feedback uh, to one another. That's the recurrent part of the network. So I will mention one particular type of RNNs, which is the long short-term memory, which is one of the most successful ones and that's used in many applications nowadays. 
And LSTMs are so successful because they address two issues of um, recurrent neural nets that are the problem of long-term dependencies and the problem of vanishing or exploding gradients. So, what can so what's, what's this uh, long-term dependency issue? What can happen is that there may be a large gap between some relevant information and the place where you need it. If you think back to that example that I gave earlier, which is I was born in France, and we're trying to predict uh, what language I speak. Imagine that right after I was born in France, I go on and explain to you all my educational and career and what I've done. And then at the end, I want to talk to you about the languages as I speak. So, well, a lot of sentences happen between I was born in France and I can speak uh, French. And re usual recurrent neural nets may not be able to remember information over that long period of time. And that happens because they are trained using um, gradient techniques. And as um, the time lag between uh, the relevant information and where you need it increases, the gradient starts vanishing exponentially fast with uh, that lag. So long-term, short, uh, long short-term memory um, network uh, resolved that issue by adding that cell state here, which is like a conveyor belt that runs through the chain and that allows to store uh, memory and remember information over long periods of times. And the cell state updates, so it has, beside the recurrent um, feedback loop for the hidden states, it has an inner loop that updates the cell state that's regulated by gates. So in this drawing here, you see several gates. The first one is called the forget gate, which is here, which will select what information from the memory cell to let through, and that is used uh, that changes over time and that is um, influenced by the input and the output from the previous layer. You have the next gate, which is um, the input gate. It will select which parts of the memory state to update and which values to use to update them. And finally, the last part, which is the output gate here, which selects which component from the memory state to uh, send to the output. So RNNs have been applied in various um, applications, such as speech recognition, language modeling, machine translation, and image captioning. And I provide here some uh, uh, references on, uh, to read more on uh, that topic. So I've explained what feed-forward networks, CNN, and RNNs are. And now I'll move to how we train those deep neural nets. Well, like many other machine learning models, the way we train them is by using some data and gradient descent um, uh, iterative methods. So we start with the training samples, which is a set of features, input vectors, and labels. So here we have M of them. And we have to choose a cost function, which measures for uh, every label what's the error between the output from the last prediction layer here, the activation at the end of the network, and the actual uh, label. And so this per sample cost, we then aggregate it to take the average error over all the samples, so I had M of them. And we add the regularization term here to curb overfitting. And so this um, cost function, the aggregate cost function, has variables which are all the weights that we saw in all the layers and all the biases. And so that is what we are optimizing over and this is what will be learned. So the way we train it is by using gradient descent. So we first uh, initialize the parameters randomly and that helps with symmetry breaking. So if you were to initialize all your weight matrices and biases with the same value, all your neurons will end up being the same. So you do a random initialization. And then we'll do gradient descent, just as usual. So we'll update every parameter using the gradient here, of the cost function. And alpha here is the step size, which regulates, um, which is also called the learning rates, and regulate uh, the size of the step you take in uh, the opposite direction of the gradient at each step. So the gradient has to be computed in every step, and this is done by backpropagation. Uh, but if you were to do that for every sample of your training set, that can become very um, 
costly. So what we do instead is actually stochastic gradient descent. And we'll do a step, so follow the negative gradient after a single sample. So here I have the cost per sample. The difference between this one and the previous one is that I removed the average. So I'm not averaging over all the samples. I'll take a step after one sample. Or you can do it after a few samples, which is a mini batch. And so you'll do an epoch is a full pass on the training set. So you go through all samples or all through mini batches. And you will do multiple passes of your training set. So go through multiple epochs. And at every pass, you will randomly shuffle the data before training on each epoch to avoid uh, some bias. A few words about back. Propagation. So what is backpropagation? It's a technique to compute the gradient numerically at every step of the gradient descent. And it works by recursively applying the chain rule for uh, derivative of compositions of functions. So I give you an example here. Let's imagine that you have a function g that you apply to some x and that gives you y. And then on top of g, you apply another function f. So your z here is just the, the composition of f and g. Then your derivative of z with respect to the input x is uh, given by this, which is the chain rule, which is the derivative of f applies to g of x, y, and then the derivative of g applies to x. And so backpropagation leverages the chain rule, and it has four steps. It first does a feed-forward pass, so computes all the activation up to the output. Then at the output, we'll compute the error, which measures uh, how much an output node contributes to the output error. Then we'll leverage this chain rule to backpropagate that error through all the layers. And that allows us to compute the partial derivatives that we need for our gradient. So that's in very uh, short how backpropagation work. The last thing that I want to mention is that uh, when you train deep neural nets, there are some um, ways to optimize the training. And I list a few common ones here. The first one is uh, you need to have a learning rate schedule. So you need to be able to adapt the learning rate as the learning progresses. And there are many techniques for that. Another very common practice is that of pre-training. So the idea of pre-training is imagine you have a very complex network that you want to accomplish some uh, desired task. So instead of training directly the very large network, you will break it, for example, into sets of sub-layers. And you will pre-train those sets of sub-layers on a simpler task, and then use what you, uh, the parameters you got from that training as an initialization for training the final network. And there are also different uh, ways to do that. Regularization is very important to curb overfitting in deep neural nets, because these networks tend to have a lot of parameters. Uh, so what we do to reduce the generalization error is um, one way is to penalize the norm of the parameters. I showed you earlier an L2 uh, regularization in the objective function, in the cost function. Another way is to augment the data set. So train using more data. You can have more data in a real, or you can uh, generate some more synthetic data. For example, if you think of images, what you could do is do a small shift on your image, translate it a little bit, rotate it a little bit, scale it a little bit, such that you generate new synthetic samples to fit to the training. Early stopping. Um, so here the idea is, um, well, what, what, does, what happens typically in uh, overfitting is when you're running your gradient over all those epochs, you will see the training error that's always decreasing, decreasing, decreasing but you will see the validation error start uh, going up at some point. And this is where you start to overfit to your uh, training set. So what you do, instead of returning the parameters that you get, that you get at the very end of, um, of your training routine, what you'll do is return them at this point in time earlier when the validation error was uh, smaller. So that's the idea of early stopping. And the last one that I want to mention is drop out. And there, the idea is to um, train sub-networks from your original networks that are formed by removing some of the uh, units that are not output units. So what you're doing is uh, corrupting a little bit the information carried by those units that you remove, um, and you force them uh, then to perform their immediate computations in a more robust manner. And the last one I'll mention is a technique called gradient 
clipping to avoid gradient exploding. So the idea is to threshold the values of your gradient either in an element-wise manner or in a norm-wise way which you would um, renormalize the norm of your gradient to keep it below a certain level. So this is uh, it for the part on training deep learning, learning networks. So I, I'll stop here and I'll take some questions. Yes. Yes. So, um, so what you're, yeah, well, so what you're saying is that, so convolution. Oh, so can we leverage Fourier transform because it's used a lot in image processing and uh, learn the coefficients of the Fourier transform? So. Uh, the idea of the use of convolution of uh, Fourier transform in um, in image processing or even for convolution is that the convolution matrix is a Fourier is a tuplets matrix, and when you slap on it the Fourier transform, it becomes a diagonal matrix, and it allows to perform in the frequency domain convolution by doing just an element-wise multiplication. So you apply Fourier matrices on the left and the right of your convolution matrix. You apply a Fourier matrix on your input, take it to the frequency domain, and there you just have to multiply your um, input vector in the Fourier domain by just the diagonal elements of your uh, convolution matrix in, uh, in, um, in the Fourier domain. So I don't see why you could not do that transformation and then learn those coefficients uh, in the Fourier domain instead of learning them in the temporal domain. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, that's something you can do. Fourier transform, again, so even in image processing, when you uh, do this convolutional filter, what you're saying is you're handcrafting that filter. Fourier, you're not handcrafting it. Here you're learning your kernel. It's part of the training. So your filter here, here is learned. Let me go back. Your kernel vector here is your convolutional filter that you would usually apply in image processing to transform your input signal or in any other signal processing. And here it's not handcrafted. It is learned by the network by feeding some data in it. Fourier transform is just a method that's used to map that filter from the time domain to the frequency domain to make the computation easier. It's not a necessarily a filter in itself. You have a filter H, you apply Fourier transform on it to take it to the frequency domain just because it makes the computation faster. It becomes an element-wise product and you can leverage fast Fourier transform libraries. That you can still do if you want to learn your coefficients in the frequency domain or the time domain, it's up to you. But the point that you're trying to make, I think, is that these don't need to be handcrafting, handcrafted and that's the entire point of deep learning. Let the data teach the model what those parameters should be instead of spending some domain expertise and manual time to come up with the right coefficients yourself. Yes, definitely. Yes. <laughs> I remember there was a talk at the, uh, you, uh, any, yes, this one. Uh, so I remember a talk earlier in another workshop where somebody uh, had a slide which said, uh, maybe it's a bit, uh, um, yeah. So he said, feature selection is dead, but welcome uh, architecture selection somehow. So yes, we're moving somehow the expertise from having to handcraft features and spending a lot of time on, on that to handcrafting uh, networks. But uh, hopefully here, um, you can handcraft networks, meaning you can handcraft the shape of some functions uh, rather than very specific features that are tailored to some raw data. And hopefully this shape of function or 
architecture can be reused in similar applications. There is still some domain expertise maybe that's necessarily in coming up with a network, um, but hopefully it's easier and um, more generalizable than uh, handcrafting hand features, yeah. Handcrafting features manually using domain expertise, yeah. Yes. Differently. With different intervals. What do you mean by different uh, intervals? Different lengths? Yeah. Uh, I mean, ah, so the, the question is can CNN uh, handle um, time series that are of different lengths? Uh, well, yes, I mean, you're. That thing is not dependent on the time series uh, lengths. You can do, if you want to control the size of your input, you can do some padding of zeros on the side, for example, of your input. So there are techniques for to do that, yes. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And you're saying each one of these events is a vector of a different length? No. Not, not no. Event the event happens at different uh, frequencies in the encoding So it's not that you, know, you input the frequency of the event, but you input the frequency of the event with uh, different uh, frequencies uh, in the box. I mean, uh, is each one of your events a different sample that you're inputting into the network? Is that what? Something happened in February, something happened in March, something happened in September, and you're saying you want the, the system to know that. Well, you can use the recurrent neural net, then you have all of these as a sequence, and each one of them is a sample, and the space in them is part of your sequence then. That's that, yeah. Yes? Um, so what you're saying is that to your board at American Express, uh, the results produced by an RNN or an LSTM appears a little bit like a black box, and it's hard to explain the intuition of why the output was produced by this input. Uh, that's not a trivial question. There is um, a new area of research that's called model explanation, where they try uh, to address that question. Uh, so I would refer you to... Uh, I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing, but that's not an easy question, I think. There are references for that. We can talk more offline. Yeah. Yes. No, there are RNNs that can handle uh, inputs of different size, of different lengths. Um, so what I presented is a general concept, which is RNN. I said that there are some types of RNNs that can handle different uh, sequences of different lengths. So that would, you would need to get more into the details, yeah. Okay. One more question. One more. 
Um, so there is parameter sharing over time. Do the weights stay constant? So let me. show you this um, image. So there is parameter sharing across time, but what you can do here, for example, is use uh, still the input and the output from the previous layer to influence how the updates are happening. So there is, I mean, yes, you do parameter sharing over, over time, but the inputs and what happened at the output at the previous layer will still have an influence. So the output is not always the same at every time instant. That's it. Okay. So let me take you. One uh, small announcement: the slides are available on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Search for hashtag KDD2017, hashtag Deep Learning. You should be able to find them. Thanks. All right, so, okay, can you hear me? Okay, so my name is uh, Leon. Uh, I will uh, basically uh, talk about uh, part two, which is basically the deep learning for uh, personalized recommender system at scale. So essentially, uh, why do you need this part? The reason is that to set, a, set up a context for our case studies uh, of job search and, and, and job recommendation at LinkedIn. So we do want to give a high level overview about, in general, when we look at the problem of deep learning plus recommender systems or personal search together, uh, how do we set up a system architecture? And uh, you know, uh, how do we look at the system, the, the, the whole problem as a whole, so that when we go to the case studies, uh, everyone can have some context. So first of all, uh, we start with, want to start with the personalized recommender systems, right? And uh, I want to just uh, simply give you some examples so everyone know what we are talking about. So today, for example, if you go to YouTube, uh, you see that a list of movies, right, recommended to you. And most likely, I mean, if you, when it's the first time you visit, because they may not have your profile, uh, they most likely recommend you the most popular ones that are generally has a very high click-through rate, right? However, the more you use YouTube, the more they are going to, based on your uh, behavior, they're going to change the recommendations, right? Uh, so, for example, I, 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 at home, I uh, use YouTube a lot to, uh, you, know, you know, show my son different videos, and he, the more he prefers one channel, then the YouTube is going to recommend videos from that channel more, right? So that, that is basically what uh, a traditional recommender system using collaborative filtering idea that tends to do, based on your behavior to do that, right? And, um, Another example is uh, you go to LinkedIn, you want to search for a job, right? That means that you are typing a query somewhere here, right? You see that, okay, I want to find a software, software engineer job uh, in uh, Silicon Valley, Bay Area, right? So then what happens is that based on your query software engineer, we're going to show you the relevant jobs that match this query and we're also going to show you only software engineer at Bay Area. We're not going to show you software engineer in Halifax, right? because that doesn't make sense, right? On the other hand, so there might be like tons of software engineer jobs in Bay Area that we have to provide a ranking, right? So that means that we need to look at your personal profile as well to understand what most are your, your, your preferences, right? So it's no longer just traditional based on query that will give you search results. It also in, involves some personalization behind it. it means that you know I will the, the engine should be intelligent enough trying to do some further ranking of all the results retrieved from the query and then based on your profile and give the most relevant ones right on the other hand uh, on our uh, you know for example in job search one of the big challenges have always been you don't want to over personalize in search context right so I'm a software engineer let's say suppose my wife uh, is, a, is a nurse right and uh, just, I just searched for a nurse job for her on my job search, right, using my LinkedIn account. Does it return software engineer or does it return nurse? When I enter nurse query, you should always return nurse, right? <laughs> but sometimes, right, 
when you do over personalization, this issue happens. Right? So that, that is why for search, we have to be very careful. We need to make sure that the, the results has to match in the query first. And given the results match the query, you do second, second ordering, right? And then to, uh, based on profile, to uh, re-rank somehow. So the third one is, uh, you know, job that may be interesting, which is job recommendation based on profile and activities, right? So the, the, the difference between this and YouTube most likely is, you know, here we not only use your activities, we also use your profile, right? Because at LinkedIn we have a very good, uh, you know, uh, people's profile and, uh, you know, we know like a lot of people have their public profiles and we know people's working history, we know people's education, uh, you know, we know how many years you are in the industry, we know which job function you work at. We use all these kind of profiles to help us to recommend jobs for you. Okay? So that is another example of the personalized uh, recommender systems. So now we have seen three examples, right? But can we abstract it in the high level, in the more generic level about what is personalized recommender system, right? Can we think about it from the abstract level to formulate the problem that we want to solve, right? Okay, so the idea is that we first have a user, right? And the user visits the website. And what information do we have, right? First of all, we may have some user features, right? And user feature can be two things, as I said. One is profile feature, meaning that we know this user, uh, you know, sometimes we know the user's age, we know user's gender, we know like the industry, we know many different things, right? And, uh, you know, and then you have a query, right? And, and, and the query is sometimes optional, meaning that for recommender system like YouTube or, you know, job recommendations, we may not have the query. But if it's a job search, people search, I'm searching for job, I'm searching for people, I'm searching for a restaurant, then the query start come. So now given the user feature and the query, I have a set of items that I need to rank, okay? And my, my problem setting is that, you know, the data I, I, I end up with is actually given the user and some item I display to the user, what is user's response, right? So user may choose to say, okay, I really like it, so that's why I'm clicking on it. I like this video, that's why I'm watching it, right? Or I really like this uh, update on Facebook, that's why I'm sh resharing it. Or I, I'm clicking on like on Facebook, or I'm commenting on Facebook, right? And uh, if I like this job, I will apply for it, right? I will save it, I will apply for it, right? Or I do many different things. So usually when users like something, they, they, there's gonna be a feedback generated from the user to the item, okay? And that's a signal we can use, okay? But if a user tends to ignore it, saying that, okay, the user, oh, sorry. The, the user, user sees it, but the user did not do anything, then that means that, uh, you know, the user may not like it, right? Uh, on the other side, the user may even say that I don't like it, right? There's something called dismiss sometimes, right? You can say, I don't like it, remove this item for me. <clears throat> so based on the user response, what you can do is that you can now use the data you think about which items should we recommend to the user, given the data we have in the past for the user, right? And that is the key problem we need to solve in the personalized recommended systems or personalized search. Make sense? So now the question is, how are I going to rank, right? And, and from the, 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 the recommended system perspective, the way you rank is saying, I'm gonna select item with the best expected utility. Because that is how we're gonna optimize. But what, what is utility, right? So that is very abstract, right? So the, the utilities are in fact depending, highly depending on, you know, the problem, the, 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 the website itself, the context, right? And what the business is trying to optimize for, okay? And uh, Examples can include, for example, if you are running a, uh, you know, a, a, a site just to simply want to attract more and more users, you may say that, okay, let me optimize for CTR, right? Click through rate. The more people click, the right, more I think the, the site is engaging, right? And uh, on the other side, if you're running an ads system, you may say, I want to optimize for revenue because that's how I get money, right? If you're running a job site, you may say, I want to make sure many people can apply, so that's why 
I want to optimize for Java Pirate. Okay? So there are many different things that you can do here to set up as a utility. But ultimately, you want to choose the items with the best effective utility. Because that is your, your, the goal of your recommended system. And, and sometimes, you can even have a combination of them. Right? Because these days we see that, uh, you know, for example, if you go to LinkedIn or Facebook, you can see a lot of sponsor updates, right? You know, you have a feed that with a lot of people's updates, and in the middle, people inject the ads, right? That happens a lot, right? Now, you, now, now system need to ask them the same question, right? Where do I place the ad? If I place the ad always on the first slot, I get a lot of revenue, but I don't get a lot of engagement. People are going to start hating this site. Why you keep showing ads to me, right? But on the other side, if I don't show any ads, then I end up with nothing, no revenue, right? So that means I have to make a trade-off between the, the, the click-through rate and revenue together. Right? So that's why it's usually a combination. A lot of times it's actually a combination of all the utilities that you care about. It can be two, it can be three, it can be four. Okay? Make sense? So, uh, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> I want to uh, then, now given that we know the problem, now let's talk about a uh, example architecture of how we set up such recommender systems in real life. So, you know, a lot of times you see two types of systems, right? One is offline which means that, you know, it is on Hadoop, distribute any distributed system, uh, like distributed system that you can run, right, mostly on Hadoop. And you also have an online system, which is online server that you are running to serve real user, user, user traffic, right? So what happens is that on Hadoop, you usually have the user interaction logs. You mean that in the past history, I know this user interact with this item, or this user did not interact with this item when I show the user's item, I mean, you have that, you have that, right? And from user interaction logs and the user features and item features, what you can do is you can do a lot of modeling here. This is where you can use deep learning, you can use many different modeling technologies, and then you can, do, you can build both models and even derived features for user and item. What does derived feature mean? Derived feature can mean, can mean that, okay, based on the thing you are telling me, I can, and also your activities, I can infer more. So some, some of the deep learning stuff actually can happen here. And what happens is that we, are, we usually have user feature store that stores the user features and raw features and derived features. And then we also have item store that stores item features as well, right? And you also have a ranking model store that stores the, the model. So now you have user visit, right, in online. Now what happens? What happens is that there's a recommended ranking the step that we were just talking about, right? The one that optimizes for the expected utility that takes features from users and items and then figure out what you do, rank items here based on your expected utility and go through some additional re-ranking steps and I will talk about what those, what those re-ranking steps can be and then get back to the user. So that is one, this high level overview about the recommended systems here, make sense? Now, so now you ask yourself, this is uh, the recommendation, what about, what, what about search, right? What happens if user give you, now give you a query? So what happens now is if the user give you a query, you need to basically construct and rewrite the query in a way that system can read, can understand, right? We call this step query construction step, which means that if user type in some raw text, you need to annotate the text with, with how, you, how you understand the text, and then, you pass it down to the, the retrieval system and retrieve the, 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 the items and match it with the query well, right? And what happens after that, you can still choose to do another step of re-ranking using recommendation. This is the personalization part that I was talking about, right? You can further personalize it and then get it back to the user, okay? Make sense? So let's go into step by step again, right? So, to, so that everyone can, can uh... oh, I have a question, yeah. Okay, so the question is how often do we need to update the search index and use a feature store? So that can be real time or near line if you want. So uh, these days actually we have infrastructure uh, you know, that allows that to happen because what happens is that user feature store is usually a key value store, right? Distributed key value store that you can just simply you know, keep updating it online. 
in real time. Every time the user updates the, their, their profile or every time user generates new activity, you can, you can try to update that in real time. And for the index, it's a little bit more difficult. So uh, I think uh, it depends on what kind of uh, open source uh, search index you are using. But however, uh, I think uh, these days most of the search index allow you to update the search index in real time as well. Right? And, and you can have a base index and you can have a like, live update or keep updating your, your index. So that is what you can do, right? So yeah. Yeah, I, I will go to that. I will go to that. In terms of how deep learning model plays here, I will go to that. Okay. All right. So let's go to go through this again. Okay. So you are training the model offline, on, for example, on Hadoop, and you push the model to online ranking model store, and you, you can also pre-generate the, the user item derived features. For example, the embeddings that we were talking about, right? The user item embeddings, right? Generated from the 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 the, the, the member profile, user profile or item item features. You can generate like embeddings from world to back or deep neural networks, and then after you have those embeddings, right? You, then you have a vector attached to a member to user ID and or item ID, and you can push that to the to the search index or the, the user feature store. Okay. So, the next thing after you have the model, when the when there's a query, when user give you a query, for example, let's give example, right? The user type in search index say Panda Express Sunnyvale. What does this mean, right? You first need to say, okay, Panda Express is a restaurant, right? And then location is Sunnyvale. But if you do the round, you will say, oh, if Panda is animal, right? So then, then you will create, create issues, right? So we want to make sure that you, the, 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 the system can understand Panda Express is a, is, a, is a restaurant, right? And then, given this query, we can retrieve all the items that matches restaurant, Panda Express, and location equals Sunnyvale. That is how you do your retrieval. So, in the context of recommender system where you don't have a query, you can still, you can still choose to do this step for candy selection. Why do you do it? When you without query, why do you still go and construct query? The reason is very simple, because sometimes you want to make sure that you form a query, right, based on the, the user features so that you, are, you can re reduce the number of items to actually score in the recommender uh, systems, right? Because that will help your latency as well, system latency as well. So for example, let's say suppose you are doing a, a job recommendation and you have a user who come and the, the title you already know is a software engineer, right? And then what you can do is saying that, okay, I, because the user is already with title software engineer, I just want to retrieve all the software engineer title for the job, for, for, for her, right? So that makes sense, right? Or you can modify say, okay, maybe senior software engineer should also be considered, principal software engineer should also be considered, right? That, that is what we do, right? Okay, make sense? So now you have retrieved all items, now you can do ranking, okay? And this is where, you know, you push, you train the model offline and you push the model to the online model score, or the model store, and then you can get all the models, uh, all, the, all the items ranked by the model, right? And what does additional re-ranking steps mean? The additional re-ranking steps here can be many different things based on the business rules. Okay, because uh, you know we work like a, as a software engineer. There's usually a product manager sitting beside us and, and saying that, look, to make sure the site runs in, with good user experience, you need to make sure that, for example, you have diversification, right? Uh, let's say suppose uh, you want to optimize for CTR, and you determine that uh, you know Google Jobs are generally very popular. Does that mean that I should show Google to all the Google Jobs to everyone? Inside, the entire site only thing is Google? No, right, the answer is because you want to make sure that your, your ranking has very diversification of different companies. That is how you generate a good user experience, okay? And you may also want to boost additional, put additional boosting on the, on the recency of the jobs, for example, or the feed updates, for example, so that people have a fresh view about, you know, what are the new stuff coming, right? Or you want to do impression discounting. What does that mean? It means that suppose a member, suppose a user has seen an item or, for example, a job or a feed update too many times, we should just stop showing them, right? Because it is not new anymore to this person. So, yeah, sure. So about the ranking model, do you mean to that uh, it ranks very steadily? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. The question is that how often do we retrain the model ranking for ranking? So uh, it is totally up to, um, you know, the modelers and themselves, 
And what we found is that, um, first of all, uh, we usually take the model, we, we, we split the model into many different components. Uh, there is usually a, a, a model that is more stable. For example, if you just want to train a model uh, based on the uh, user profile features, right? That model can stay, let's say, for a week, right? You can choose to daily, every day you can train, train it, uh, but uh, you know, what, what our past experience that you can, it can stay for a week or a month, it's still it's gonna be fine. Uh, because the feature are going to keep changing, right? But the model itself can remain the same. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes we may have some model that updates more frequently, right? Just simply because, you know, uh, for example, let's say the embed, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the user, learning user activities, right? Suppose we want to uh, learn user activities to the items, we may want to say that, uh, you know, since the user keep changing their activities over time, we may want to quickly, quickly update the, the model for the user, right? If we want to build a per-user model, right? So that is where it may have very frequent updates for the model, yeah, go ahead. You can choose to have a model for the user. Yeah. So. Oh, so so basically the question is that suppose you want to build a model per user, how does deep learning play here, right? So you can choose to say that let me build the embedding for the user. Based on the profile, you can choose to build the embedding vector based on user activity. Yeah, so, uh, so basically, you, if your question is about uh, how do I serve such per user model, we can cover that. I will cover that. Yeah, so, yes, so let me show you. So model store doesn't imply model per user, doesn't necessarily imply model per user. Yes, so model store doesn't necessarily imply model per user. This is just simply, the store can store multiple models that you can run on, on an A-B test, right? So, but the, the, actually what happens is that if you want to build a per user model online, uh, sorry, if you want to put, build a per user model and push it online, the user feature store actually is gonna store all the models for the user because that is keyed by user. You can choose to put all the embeddings, in deep learning context, you can choose to put all the embeddings of the user into the user feature store and treat it as a feature. That is how, the, that's a, one implementing detail that you can have if you want to do it. Does that make sense? Okay, so the question is that do we only use deep learning model in, in, in LinkedIn or we use a lot of other models? So the answer is we use a combination of deep learning models and tree models and the linear models. We're gonna talk about in case studies, yeah. So the question is that uh, suppose you uh, do too much recent boost, you're gonna end up with losing relevance. But if you ch choose to optimize for relevance, then you end up with losing re recency and the job looks like stale. Uh, so so, so I, I think this is a good, very good point. Actually, this is exactly one of the challenges that we face. So one way to do it is you do a guardrail, meaning that you, uh, what you do is you cut somewhere. So you, you, if, your relevance, you, if your relevance model gives you some score, and then you look at the score distribution, you figure out where, you should cut the line saying that I'm from, from the, for all the models, for all the items that we score lower than this threshold, I'm not going to show. So then you only re-rank the, 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 the items that are above the, the certain threshold, which will make your life much better. Model. 
uh, if you are if you're asking about, uh, I think I think you, the question is about how do you generate the negative labels for the for the for the for the for the data, right? So I, I think the negative labels can be generated from I display this to you, but I did not, but you did not click or apply. Or, however, that has presentation bias, like what you may, may point out. And uh, one way is you do some randomization on your side still, so that you can collect some more unbiased data. Yeah. Yeah, I think the last question because we may be running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do we store user and item inter interaction features? So the, the, that's where you store here. So the ways of the user item interaction features can be stored here. Okay, yeah, so but, but by on that one, you can actually, what you can do is you can, uh, you, can uh, you need to do some uh, decomposition because in that case, what happens is that you may have very uh, little data or very sparse data for you to learn from. So it won't be worthwhile for you to remember which user click on which item exactly online, in the online phrase. Uh, the reason is that uh, that item, anyway, the user click on it. No, no, not, not, it doesn't matter too much to show it again. But you want to use that signal. That's what you are saying, right? Yeah, yeah because you want to use the signal, you can, what you can do is you can, on the, for example, on the user side, you can generate the embedding, user embedding, uh, based on the item feature that the user clicked on in the past. And on the item side, you can generate the embedding of the item based on the user feature happening in the, in, the, in the past. Does that make sense? So that you have some abstraction. Otherwise, what happens is that, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think, I think uh, maybe, maybe later on when we go to the details about case study, I think that may make things a little bit clearer. Does that make sense? Okay. So I, I think I, we, we should really move on. Yeah, let's move on. We can, we can have another round of Q&A when I finish this part. <clears throat> so let, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about how deep learning plays here, okay? So first of all, there are tons of literature about how deep learning can help in recommended system. I'm not going to go through, going through it every one by one by one, but uh, I just want to let everyone know that later on you can uh, take a look at these papers and these papers are highly relevant in my opinion, okay? So, from, from, from our uh, system architecture before, actually, uh, you know, there are four components that we generally believe that deep learning can really help. And I, I basically read, read marked all of them, and we're going through one, one of them uh, one by one, okay? And the first one is about, uh, you know, uh, building the user and item embeddings through offline uh, modeling, and then treat that as derived features. So one good example here is that Suppose you have user features here and item features here, right? And, and you have a similarity function at the end between the user and item, and you want to say that, okay, so, so traditionally you can, what you can do, you can do cosine similarity of the user feature and the item feature just by themselves, right? Uh, and, but that usually don't work because they are you know, very different, they can be very different, they can very, be, be very different context. So that's why uh, you, know, you want to build additional layers to build embed embeddings using new neural network here, right? So what you can do is you can say, okay, let me, let me first transform, trans, uh, treat each token of the user feature and, 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 and concatenate all the embeddings of each token and then going through a, a deep learning neural, neural network, right? Multi-layer deep neural network and finally generate one embedding vector for every user, right? And on item side, I can also do exactly the same thing. And finally, what happens is that your loss function will be a cosine similarity function that between the embeddings of the user and item rather than the raw features which works much better than just simply using the raw features, right? So then what, what happens in online? What happens online is that you can choose to push the user embedding vector to the user feature store, right, key value store, that's why you can retrieve them online, and you can also push the item embedding store, a vector to the item store, so that you can retrieve item online as well. Make sense? So another part that deep learning can help is about the query, right, annotating the query and the query formulation. So let me give you an example. Suppose someone type in Apple Watch. You have two options, right? You can say that Apple is a food and watch is a product, or you can say Apple Watch is a product. In this context, of clearly uh, Apple Watch is a product. But you, know, you will need certain knowledge of semantics so that you know that Apple Watch is a product, right? So that is where 
usually, you know, you know, using using the, the deep learning can help in terms of understanding semantically what the word actually means. And on the other side, uh, on uh, the, the other point is about multilingual text about transfer learning, right? For for, for for different languages, right? Here you will know that okay, in Chinese, Panda Express, how it, how you say, right? Because if 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 it, if you are learning a, a, a data with many many different languages, you will be able to actually quickly get that okay, this is actually how. Uh, it, it, it translates without even someone telling you this is the case. Okay, this helps a lot, and and cross the main understanding as well, right? So, for example, someone search for people uh, that includes skills inquiry, and someone search for job including skill inquiry. Usually, these two are highly correlated. You can also mine right using deep learning techniques. And and I just here I just have a quick example of the the one that uh, that we showed before. So if you have you have, if you, here I, I basically replace the user, uh, the, the user feature and item feature with query and document, right? So basically you have query on this side and document feature on this side, and you can have going through multi-layer new, new network and have a similarity function at the end of the day between the query and document. And let's say suppose query is Apple Watch. If you do deep learning, you may end up with saying that iPhone, iPad, this document are quite close to the, to, the, to the Apple Watch on the embedding space, right? Vector space. However, orange swatch, although it looks very similar word, however, it ends up with someone which is far away from here. Does that make sense? Yeah. And in terms of recommendation ranking models, I think someone was asking this question about what kind of model we use in production. And, and what we do, the, the, the approach we take here in general is that we are not only going to only use deep models here, however, we also, uh, Rather, we also use the, 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 the wide models that include so many features and for us to be able to uh, optimize for our performance of the model. So it's a combination of the feature, many, many different features, and a lot of deep features. So uh, what are the challenges that we have and open problem we have for deep learning for recommended systems? So first of all, of course, it's very large data, right? You need to make sure that you can train the model in, at scale. And we do have a lot of you know, tools these days. <laughs> and it's very hard to evaluate which one is better. I'm not going to you know, take the time to evaluate because you know, there are tons of uh, folks that have already done so and uh, you can feel free to take a look on their website and there are tons of paper that evaluate the approaches. Uh, ourselves, we, I mean, we have found that TensorFlow and CNTK, this is what we usually use and uh, those generally work very well. Very well. Um, there's also a lat latency issues from online scoring that people generally worry about. So the way we handle it, there are two ways of uh, there. There are two approaches that we take in general. So the first one is about pre-generation of the user and item embeddings offline and push them online. That's the one we discussed, right? So what you, the trick you do is that instead of instead of just trying to uh, use score every deep learning for every user and item online, you can actually choose to pre-generate. If you know the user profile, you can just pre-generate and push it to the key-value store. And when user comes, you just retrieve it without computing it, right? And and for the item, you can do exactly the same thing, okay? And uh, another trick is that you don't have to score the true to score the most complex model for every, for every item, right? What you can do is that you can actually have multi-layer. You can have a simple model initially uh, to, 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 to score, let's say, all the items, and then you, 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 after you pick the top K, and you go to score the more and more complex uh, models, right? So, so we have, like, uh, for example, we have like almost three layers or four layers of, of scoring so that making sure that uh, you know, we, we, we can optimize the latency. So the last one is the batch versus online training. Of course, that's always a challenge, right? So the question is that do you want to wait for one day to train a model or do you want to wait for like five minutes to train a model? I mean, usually that is always a trade-off that you need to make. It's a hard question. Okay, so I'm done with my parts. Yeah, how, how many time? How much? We have 10 minutes, okay. 10 minutes, okay, okay. So we can take questions, yeah. So the, the, the question is, uh, in the context of the job, uh, how do we differentiate uh, people's seniority? Because like uh, financial may have VP as entry level, but uh, you know, uh, VP at engineering is, uh, is very high, right? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, so that, yeah, basically, you know, 
that's a good example, right? So I think uh, the answer is that uh, what you can do is uh, you can actually learn people's profile uh, from people transition profile. That's how we do it. So at LinkedIn, we do know that people's working history. We know that you move from a, a financial industry. We know I know that okay, you move from VP to some other title. I don't actually I don't know the title be, uh, above VP in <laughs> financial industry. But let's say you you move from VP to senior VP or to something else, right? And, and then we know, okay, senior VP generally should be at least the same level as VP or even higher, right? You, when, when you create this pairwise uh, learning, you can actually learn, learn from the, you can create pairwise learning, learn from the, 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 the transition of the people's career history. That is how you learn the seniority in general. But data is generally also very noisy because there's also company size as well. Because people sometimes, people are VP in a small company, even engineering, and then move to a big company, become a, you know, Senior software engineer, and then you okay. <laughs> so that that is something that the company size also need to be taken into the, the consideration. That's why it's still a hard problem. But that is the approach we have been taking to solve the seniority. There's a slide uh, later with exactly that example. Oh. Yeah. Exactly, precisely the VP example. Yeah. Later. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh yeah, so the question is that uh, how does utility function relate to the user response or profile? That is exactly how you build the model, right? So essentially, let's say take CTR as an example. I think, I think yeah, that's, that's something that I, I missed. So the CTR actually means that it's the probability of the clicks. So in this case, you have the positive, you, have, you build, build the model as positive as click and negative as you do not click. So that is how you're gonna uh, score how, how, you, how, how, you, how your model can figure out the probability of click given, uh, given I and J, and you will use the probability of click to, to rank. And that is how you optimize for the CTR. So what happens is that basically your model needs to give the expected value of utility based on the user interaction data and profile feature. And then the way you do it is you rank by the probability of the, uh, by the expected utility. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, let me take a question from the back. Yeah. So the question is, are there different challenges for wide net networks than uh, as, uh, comparing to the deep networks? I think there are definitely yes. Uh, so for the wide networks, what happens is that you generally worry about feature selection. Uh, and and uh, you know, also scoring such features uh, generally take a lot of time as well, right? Uh, for deep networks, uh, you don't have that problem, but you may end up with uh, overfitting, etc. right? So that is why uh, usually a combination of the two is generally give you much better result. Yeah. So. Yeah, could you just elaborate a bit more what was actually your discussion there? Was it that there was enough framework to make it easier to have the interaction go from dark to day? Uh, the question is that what exactly tooling we use in production today so I think I already said for offline training, we tend to use TensorFlow on Spark and uh, CNTK as well. Uh, for the uh, online, LinkedIn has their own system. Uh, I think LinkedIn opens also open source a lot of systems, such as, for example, user feature store. We used to have Volimore. Now we have Espresso. I mean, you can, you can look it up. And, uh, but uh, I think uh, if you go to like uh, Amazon, AWS, or Google Cloud, they all have their own distributed key value stores. Right, I think I think Amazon uses DynamoDB, 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 DynamoDB right? Also DynamoDB yeah, yeah, yeah. Service. yeah, 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 yeah. So what is Google? Google is using. <sighs> don't remember. Facebook used to use Cassandra. Didn't yeah, yeah, yeah. So every every company they have all their own systems, and it's very hard to generalize. But uh, most of the good thing is most of the things are open source. You can you can actually look at you know all the, uh, or uh, you you can look at all the Apache supported uh, you know, key value stores etc. Really? Okay, because we, we, we got the TensorFlow on Spark working very well in our distributed system. Yeah. yeah. How to make the trade-off? Yes, that's, that's a question that I always get when I give this slide to people. <laughs> uh, so so the, the, this is going to be challenging because uh, 
you know, uh, if, when you have multiple uh, when you have multiple uh, utilities, then uh, the trade off generally are, are, are difficult to make because uh, product has a lot of say, right? And also, you want to grow, grow the business based on the different uh, environment that you are living in, right? So that is why we have something called a framework called multi-objective optimization, right? And there are a bunch of papers published by LinkedIn uh, in the past conferences. Uh, you can you can look it up uh, on a multi-objective optimization part. Uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's uh, in general, it is something like you want to optimize the the the, the for example, in the CTR and revenue trade-off part. What you can do is you can say that I want to more optimize for the revenue, maximize the revenue, such as CTR does not drop by X percent if I compare it to if I just purely optimize for CTR. So then what happens is it becomes a constraint optimization problem, and you can solve it using Lagrange multiplier. And when you solve the Lagrange multiplier, it essentially mean, means that you can, you can turn out to be a weighted sum between the CTR and the revenue, and where the weight becomes a dual of the optimization, constraint optimization. So there are tons of paper that uh, you know, shows you, you can, you can look it up, that published people, uh, published by LinkedIn people that you know, talking about how to make the trade-off between multiple utilities. It's, uh, it's, not model it's not a model specific, actually. It is quite a generic framework. You can plug in any model you want. Yeah. Yes. So I think this is uh, what you are saying is still the same thing, right? So how do I optimize uh, between multiple metrics which doesn't talk to each other, right? That's what I was saying. That's a multi-objective optimization framework that you can that we build at LinkedIn, and there are tons of paper published. You can take a look. Yeah. Go ahead. Which one? List wise. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 so this utility also, right? You can be NDCG if you want, right? It's fine. Yeah. Oh, but, but okay, I think what you're asking for, you're asking for something else. You're asking for, I rank based on the list. I don't rank based on the... Yeah, but that's the latency you have issue, right? Because if you have an item to choose and you, you choose K, then you have N choose K problem. <laughs> so the, it's, it's a, that, that is much more difficult to rank online. That's why we actually do, do additional re-ranking. That's also one reason we do additional re-ranking, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah absolutely, multitask learning is definitely something you can do, right? So I, I think, uh, uh, I, we, we, one thing we do find helpful is that we do find that, uh, you know, the, for example, the embeddings, embeddings generated from the user profiles can be generally shared across LinkedIn applications, and we found that very useful. Yeah. Oh, so I think this one, I think uh, Ben most likely will cover more. So the idea is that uh, this one is a deep part, and and basically we, this one is the, the, the similarity function it can be, and you 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 can uh, have a combination of the wide and deep together, and they are going to sum sum the weighted sum, and finally go into the loss function that you have. Yeah. But you have you, you have the user interaction log. That is what what you do. You have user interaction logs with the item. Yeah, that is how you, how you optimize for. Oh, because, you, because that is how you train the model, right? So you have, this, uh, you have this similarity function, right? And after you have a similarity function, you can change it to, to a probability function using logistic transformation, for example. And once you do that, then uh, 
then it become a you 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 it become the probability of the user interact user interaction or user action given the the query and document and then you just use that logistic uh, link, uh, transformation function that give you probability and then you you can use that in your data basically you have the data saying that it's one or zero although it's binary but when you have a lot of data it become a probability think about you are tossing a coin every time you get a, get get a get a head or you get a tail but if you toss it 10,000 times, then you know it's 50-50, right? That then means probability is, is 0.5. And what happens is that you're gonna change that, transfer that 0.5 using logistic back to a, 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 a between minus infinity to infinity. And that is what, a, or, 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 or between zero to one, that is what similarity function still happens. That makes sense? Yeah, so, so so that, that, that's what we have been doing. All, all you need is just a mathematical monotonic transformation to make it to be, to change the scale. Yeah, that, that is basically exactly what we are doing. Yeah. Uh, so we tried both, actually. We tried both GPU and TensorFlow on Spark. So the reason that we like TensorFlow on Spark more is because it hooks up with our distributed system well, because uh, we can link this job to many, many different other jobs. For example, you, for example, before you run deep learning, you also want to do data preparation, right? When you want to do data preparation at scale, uh, you, have a, you really have a MapReduce job or whatever job there, right? And, and what happens is that you need to be able to hook up that job directly with this job so that you are able to build the workflow together. So uh, you can also build an infrastructure that allow you to, com to, 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 to combine two jobs like that when you're using the GPU. That's also fine, but it's just much easier for us to do that that way. Well, it can be up to, let's say, one terabyte, for example, right? So. <laughs> uh, you can still use one machine but it's just slower to, pr to process the data. Yeah. Yeah, but the, what you are talking about is the training, which I totally agree. But I'm talking about before you do training, you need to prepare the data. And during the time you prepare all the data, actually having, using a distributed way might, be, might, might help you. But it's, it's, I think it depends on the infrastructure. I mean, I mean, if someone, you know, set up the infrastructure, a single machine can do that, that's also fine, I think. Well, I think right now uh, you can try to blend them into the model if you want, but our past experience here it did not work very well, because uh, if you want to really really put into the model, you need to have very 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 unbiased data, but the, the, your your product may not allow you to do that because, uh, for example, if you are running Facebook feed, it may not be a good idea to show people randomly some updates that are 180 days old, right? So then, you do, if you don't have the data that you cannot learn it easily in the, in the model. Right? So that's why you have to make a trade-off somewhere. Saying that, okay, I'm just gonna impose this business rule and I'm, I'm done. Right? So, uh, yeah, yeah. Can you just share a bit more details about the specific model you're using now? Like the dimensionality of the embedding? Oh, that, that one will go to, we still have two parts. <laughs> we are not done. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so, so I, I think a lot of questions, I think Ben will talk about it. Right, so we still have two parts, yeah. So two case studies here. Yeah, we have two case studies that will discuss all the details, okay? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Do I see what? Code start, yeah. So code start, of course, that's why we are using deep learning, right? So uh, because, uh, you know, one way, one, one, one really, one, one thing that deep learning can really help is that uh, for, the, for the user who just simply joined the LinkedIn, 
they usually have a good profile. When you join LinkedIn, they ask you to enter a lot of things, right? When they join LinkedIn and enter a lot of things, it ends up with a very good profile, and we use that to build the embedding for the user, and then we can use that embedding to help our uh, recommendation, right? That is what, how we use to solve the cold start problem. Same thing. When an item just gets created, let's say a new job just gets created, we can just simply create embedding for the item and then push it online to the system. Uh, yeah. yeah, so for the question is that uh, what is the uh, what is the uh, optimization function related to the uh, IDs? I think for the recommender systems, it is actually user and item, okay? And for the search, it actually is a query and document. You can also choose to have user, third dimension here, but as I said, you, you, you need to be careful because if you, if you just only optimize for the, on the if, you, if you optimize for too much for the user side, then you, you end up with uh, not be able to respect the query. So that's why user did not happen here. So we need to be careful for the search. How do I combine the personalized search with recommendation? You can combine it by sharing features. But still optimization are different because for search, you are optimizing for NDCG, and for, for the job recommender system, you are optimizing for job apply or some other things. So the optimization utility are still different, but you can share features. For example, all the member, all the user embeddings can be shared. Right? All the, all the, a lot of item embedding can also be shared because if they are both job search and job recommendation, item embedding can also be shared. But still, the optimization are different. Right? Okay, so one more question and then we can take a break. I know you guys have a lot of questions, but uh, just keep in mind that we have two parts left and that, you know, after that we also have a lot of Q&As, okay? And, and you can catch us offline. Yeah, you can also catch us offline, right? Yes. Yeah, so I think uh, we, at this point at LinkedIn, we are not doing it right now. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, published, I think you can go and check out this paper. But uh, if I remember correctly, it was done through like some hash technique. Yeah. It's, it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we will take like a 30 minutes break. And uh, when we come back, we still have uh, two more parts to cover. So please make sure that you come back. Thank you very much. <laughs>